how would you like to know how much it costs you in time, but also money looking for property that may not actually exist? Hi, I'm Joe Krause. And I'm Sam Power, and we're the hosts of Property Powers Australia. And in this episode, we're going to be discussing the common pitfalls that a lot of buyers do fall into in you know, becoming a potential unicorn property finder. Yeah, it's very interesting. You, Sam, presented a bunch of information on the actual time that it takes somebody to find a property, the average time an Australian takes to find a property. Uh, and then we weigh that up with mathematics on what that can cost you if it's your hourly rate, which is quite alarming, that figure, Sam. And then we also add that what that can cost you by sitting on the sidelines and not being in the market, like the opportunity cost. Yeah, and then towards the back end, I give you some really helpful tips around how to actually ensure you're not being that unicorn property buyer. So it's not going to cost you that you know, potentially $100,000 in you know, lost time and, and money going through this property buying journey for you. Yeah, we, sh- we share a little bit about how to uncondition ourselves from what we have been taught a great property looks like because the market changes a a lot and we need to meet the market. So Sam talks about how to meet the market so you're not falling victim to, you know, having money burning a hole in your pocket. Yeah, there's a lot of definitely value that we can add into this this, this process and like it's a really insightful episode I got a lot out of it and it's good to share because it's just a common thing that I see in every single day during the mic. Uh, professional life so i want to share it with you and yeah i hope you got a lot yeah obviously this is not the only way we can help you for free guys uh check out our how to maximize your borrowing capacity mini course um at propertypowers.au forward slash free resources actually it's just resources just go to the home page you'll see all the awesome stuff we've got a couple of resources there and uh yeah let's dive in sam Welcome to Property Pals, the podcast where we share everything around how to build a property portfolio from researching areas, financing, structuring, buying, selling, and reinvesting to live a life of financial independence. As a disclaimer, any information shared by myself, Jared, Sam, and the Property Pals team is strictly general and should not be taken as constituting professional advice. You should consider seeking independent legal financial and taxation advice from a qualified professional. I'm good. Uh, woke up this morning, had a fun surf. Didn't get barreled though. For everybody listening, Sam got barreled last week uh, with the boys uh, in a spot that we normally have been going to for you know, a big portion of our lives and kind of jealous, kind of jealous, Sam. Uh, uh, what, I, what I really miss about home is surfing with the boys. It's like, and then like if we can, lunch after or like a little little meal after, my favourite. It's always a good time. But now the, uh, my surfs aren't as frequent as yours, but I'm glad I'm getting you jealous. Uh, it makes <laughs> me feel like I'm, I'm on an interesting path, but they're few and far between these days. Uh, but still, when they do, it's a it's a good feeling and it makes me feel a lot younger, a lot more agile. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and on your forehand too. Sam is a goofy footer for everybody listening, and so growing up on the Gold Coast has been mostly right hand point break. So getting some practice on going left, Sam is good, and that's what I'm been trying to do whilst I'm over here as well. Uh, but yeah, let's yeah. Like what you, are the, what are the you crowds, shot me an email what are the today. Crowds like over there. The crowds oh, yeah, actually so. is so good. It's so good. Uh, at the moment, there's not too many people because it's coming into wet season. There's this period of wet season that's like beautiful, but I don't want to talk too much about that because I don't want too many people coming over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm coming over in, May, in April. Perfect. Or May. Perfect. First of May. That's the plan. We'll, we'll be reunited for our podcast sittings together sitting next to each other, which is going to be great. Does that mean I don't have to bring all my stuff over? Absolutely. My stuff? I don't have to bring anything. Just bring your cute face and we'll be good. My cute kids and my wife uh, and they can all jump yeah, in. Yeah. Also, for everybody <laughs> listening, Sam shot me a really good email. I came in from a surf and uh, he's got this email breakdown of uh, the trap of being a unicorn property finder, which is what we're going to talk mm. about today. And just some of the notes you took there, Sam, are just absolutely brilliant. Where do you want to start with this? <laughs> there's, there's so much in it. What is, what is a well, unicorn always- property buyer? Well, what's a unicorn? Jared, uh, a mythical, magical creature. 
Yeah, that may or may not exist. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, the unicorn buyer is what I talk about. And I guess the the catch line is uh, I did a couple of calculations and, um, yeah, it can be costing you up to $100,000 just by being this unicorn property. I call them property finders, not buyers. Mm. So um, I hope that kind of makes sense because the whole purpose is that, you know, you can – have the intention of being a buyer but if you are a unicorn finder you'll constantly be finding and that's the issue we're going to be talking about and how to ensure that you know you're not going to be one of those people that's going to be still in the market 12 months later or you know even two years later still looking for this you know mythical creature of a unicorn property yeah absolutely so i don't where, where do we start from here right there's it's it's a massive trap for uh, the opportunity cost is quite large. Like we've thrown out a pretty, uh, and people may think it's a clickbaity title, but it's not. It might bring you in for this podcast episode. However, the maths are, are real, right? So you've got, you know, a three three key reasons why looking for a unicorn can cost you a fair bit of money. Let's let's dive into those. Yeah, well, I guess it's all come out of like look, I get asked these you know, questions and. I've got a lot of clients that come to us and they've got a budget and their dream property type in mind. Um, mm. But yeah, the, the reoccurring challenge that I'm constantly seeing is helping them to try and like figure out, you know, what they're actually on the hunt actually exists, if that makes mm. sense. And then, yeah. Um, yeah, it's sort of a big part of that strategy side of things. So I hope people can get a lot of value out of it. But yeah, the, the three key reasons why looking for that unicorn um, I say it can cost you up to hundred grand, and we'll break down some figures. But first things first is there's you you as a unicorn finder, property finder, you're like uh, it's like probably that mental thing, right, in your head. And Jared, you probably be able to help me explain this a bit better. But you're more susceptible to falling for agents' sales tactics and campaigns to try and get you in, and, and you're just a statistic on their front because they know that. You will never have that budget to get to purchasing this property, but they want you involved in the process to create that additional level of uh, you know, buy demand. And then they can talk about you as a potential buyer to other buyers with a higher budget level that, oh, there's another offer coming in and that's conditioning somebody else. And you're just a statistic that's going to fall prey. And the issue around that from a cost perspective is if you think you have a chance, and you ask this agent, you know, do I have a chance? You know, what what kind of figure buys this property? And if it's um, all that makes sense to you to go in, you're going to be spending money on a contract review with your solicitor, and you're going to be spending money on a building and pest report. So whilst they're not big expenses, on average in Australia, people miss out on five to six properties before they jump in um, to, I guess, sometimes emotionally overpaying. So. The whole process, if you're doing that, it might be a thousand bucks each property. If you get a contract review and you get a building pest report, you do that five times, you know, there's five grand just gone down the drain. Yeah. That's a big point. Uh, so, the average of like five to six properties they look at or well, seriously look at before they actually find the right one. You mentioned before, like, so obviously that's the first point of like how it can cost you money out of the three the three reasons but before like you mentioned this first point here you mentioned trying to get people aligned with you know does this property even exist and i guess that's the most important thing right is this this is going to help you prevent you from having to go through these three reasons why people end up you know suffering from a huge opportunity cost up to $100,000 because they haven't really educated themselves in the market which is only you can only do that in the market for what is available, uh, and this is the this is the thing where people may listen to other you know media sources like YouTube videos, podcasts, read books that may be ten years old, or follow strategies that don't that can exist but don't produce fruitful results based on a book years and years and years ago and have this ideology of a property that they need to purchase that's going to get them to their goals whereas the market's ever evolving so that so i guess it's important for people to be at least elastic and flexible to market changes to be able to 
get into the market and move with it versus like try and make the market be what they want and sit on the outside of it until they realize there's a lot of opportunity costs gone. Absolutely. And that's, uh, I guess we talked on this a few times throughout in different episodes. So if you, you know, go back and listen to those first 30 foundational episodes we talk about, but uh, a big part of that is you've got to understand the market you're buying into. And sure, you might have seen a property that sold three months ago for, that was at the top end of your budget, hypothetically a million dollars. But if that area has grown, you know, in 5% in that three months, you know, that million dollars is now a million and 50 round numbers. I love it. But your budget, therefore, is just no longer viable. And then you're, I'm seeing people and we, we have clients, we have these conversations with them. That's why it's top of mind at the moment. Mm. And, you know, in their head, like, I'm not a pushy person. It's their money. It's their choice all for that. But the areas that were showing those really good signs of growth, they're now no longer able to purchase into. So we're having these harder conversations three months later and um, you know, just trying to educate them that, hey, unfortunately, because we didn't have that, you know, you, you, well, was it my fault being the trusted advisor or the client's fault, you know, not wanting to spend the money? I'm not sure, but it's just one of those things where I was like, well, that property three months ago was a, was a really good deal. You know, we missed out on it by 10 grand. You know, this is kind of why I say that in a growth market, you pay that extra 10 grand because in three months' time, that's going to be worth another 30 grand more. So it's kind of just trying to educate people and help people understand that process. But that it, it comes from the setup too. And mm. knowing what your budget is and going through and filtering the sold section in the last month or three months to see would you, would you have purchased these properties uh, in these target areas and seeing what they sold for and then looking at the growth data from that front is the, the perfect way just to check in and make sure that, hey, yeah, actually, you're not looking for a unicorn uh, because unicorns come around once every six, 12 months um, and that's at best, right? And then mm-hmm. the issue that people do find if they are these unicorn buyers is then they want to bargain. You know, they want to buy it under market value and it's like, well, this probably comes around once every six, 12 months. There's probably everyone that's in the market at that point in time just puts their eyes onto that property type. It might be an inexperienced agent. I don't know its value or a seller who doesn't know its value. Um, and that's where speed comes in, in the confidence of knowing, one, what it's worth, and two, how to negotiate as hard as possible. And that's the skill set of the buyer's agent that you should be working with to help go down that path with you. But, yeah, I thought it's... Yeah. Um, that would be that's the, that's the first key point that we've a lot of people come to us too late in that first point of they want to go it alone all power to you go for it but it's the they've missed out they've spent that five thousand dollars on multiple contract reviews building a pest reports they're sick of it that's that pain point which we talk about a lot which is I don't want people to get to that stage because that's when you throw the extra fifty thousand dollars on the table just to you know get it over and done with and move on to the next stage in your life because you're sick of missing, you're sick of paying for these, you know, fees. And, yeah, that's sort yeah. of like obviously why I'm passionate about, you know, the value that buyers agents can provide in this transaction. Yeah, spot on. I, I, I'm with you there. And I'm, I'm a big believer in you get what you pay for. And there are, unfortunately, we, the mindset of being cheap can cost you have a cheap, experience and a cheap life and a cheap investment and like i don't think a cheap investment is typically the way to go uh when we're buying businesses and i'm particularly to buy businesses you can either buy something that is like going sideways in terms of growth going down or going up i tell people to not buy things that are going down sideways is okay but if you buy something that's going up in value you can spend that extra little bit of money to get into the market to purchase that with confidence it's going up. Obviously, you don't want it to be at the very peak of the market cycle in the area, and that's why you use buyer's agent and good data and stuff like that. But if you'll just get halfway through or just at the start, it's worth paying that extra because you have confidence that market and that property is growing in that market. And yeah, I wanted to bring it back to that because like being cheap can cost you in the long run. And 
yeah, there's there's some more points here as well. You mentioned the opportunity cost of you know getting into the market like by doing some research yourself, but you've got some pretty outstanding numbers here on how many hours people spend on average you know looking for a property share those with, with us yeah so statistics in australia uh and i'm getting more and more into the stats as i get into this um space because it, it helps me deliver a, a message that i know that, that i'm just rubbish at delivering to people because <laughs> no you're not uh, it's better <laughs> better to lean on the data side of things to sort of paint that picture i've found and um, it enables people to go off and research themselves so it's not that uh, don't trust me go and look at look at the information for yourself but i'll point you in that direction to look into and you know, the statistics show that uh, the average buyer is spending seven to nine months in the property buying process so that's you know three, nine months that's getting your pre-approval refreshed twice so get it initially yeah. then you refresh it twice or even just transact so there's a lot of time involved in that and then on top of that you're all you're looking at all these properties right and on average uh, people are spending eight hours a week looking at properties. So if you are in that moment in this period of time and you're wanting to buy a house for you, you know, yourself or an investment property, you know, chances are you're probably spending about eight hours. And that could just be scrolling through on realestate.com. It could be doing a bit of education, understanding that whole process. But over that nine-month period, that's 247 hours. Mm. So nine that's months, huge. eight hours a week, 247 hours on average. Eight Easily. hours a week for nine months. Yeah, yeah, it's a That's, long time. How and people complain they don't have time. That is crazy. Yeah, well, I mean, you just think about it, right? Like if you're yeah, in that buy zone, sense. you're going in. You're even inspecting properties, like on the weekends. Yeah, like yeah, you can spend eight hours on a Saturday going to three different open homes. Yeah. So my point on this number two is, what's your time worth? And if you're running it. You know, say you're on 50 bucks an hour over 247 hours, that's 12 grand just in your time spent trying to look for a property. Wow, that's a really good frame, mm. like really good way to frame it. It's, it's costly, like $50 an hour. I mean, like most people listening are probably making more than $50 an hour. Yeah, well, yeah, that's why, like, I guess later in my early in my stage, right? And, and people's journey is different, so I fully understand that. Where they work their full time job and they um, it empowers them to do that research and education. Yeah. All power to you. Go and do it. This is something you can do yourself. Can you do it better than those that do it every single day for a living? The answer for me, I mean, maybe with some, you know, higher like low experience buyers agents potentially, but. You know, more times than not, someone that's doing something every single day and getting paid to do it is a lot more efficient um, at doing it. So mm -hmm. if you have that ability and you can outsource it, obviously it's a it's a win. Um, I say just make sure that you are connecting with the good quality um, people in that space, whether it's selling or buying. Um, Absolutely. A little bit of a plug, obviously, on our end. Reach out to us, hello at propertypowers.au. Um, we'll put you in contact with you know, people that I know. Um, personally and work with you know throughout this I guess, ecosystem but just yeah let me to... ask you a question around that uh there you go well have you think about the and this is for the listener as well think about everybody that you know that is pretty successful in life and like i'm talking like extremely successful in terms of wealth creation i'm talking not just like a millionaire because there's so so many of us are millionaires right um there's a lot of people that are millionaires compared to like people that are like i don't know maybe have a property portfolio of like 10 and or have like you know large businesses and, and really making some serious money in wealth creation if you think about those people maybe you do know some like personally maybe you don't know some personally but maybe you know of them and maybe you know of them through media like books and either this but how like how many of those people have gotten wealthy with just doing absolutely everything themselves, not hired one professional on the way? Like how many people have done that? I can't think of anybody in my life. Can you, Sam? No, no. I mean, there's so much to do in a day. Like yeah. even to like mowing your lawns, yeah, <laughs> cleaning your house. Um, I mean. 
There's so, the, <laughs> what if you wanted to fly to Sydney? Do you just go and get your pilot license? You do that exactly. For yeah, <laughs> that's a really good point. And like we we mention this because it's important and it's it's a really good thing to understand. At the same time, you don't need to use the buyers agents we recommend. Even if you just yeah. like, I had a chat with some friends in property the other week, and I was like, you don't need to use the people I recommend. Just go do your own research if you want. Like, mm. but just still use them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or at least me let me pair them all together and you know give you a, a, a decent overview um, exactly on on their processes from an inside perspective before we continue today's pod i want to ask you a few questions what is your property investment goal what type of properties do you want to own how many what size valuation property portfolio do you want to own and how much net income do you want to be earning essentially what's your magic number in passive income that you want to be earning and do you know how to get there and if you do do you know how to get there in the least time possible with the least amount of risk? Sam and I have been helping people invest in property and build property portfolios for years. People who are now replacing their income through property and we want to help you do the same. Right now for a limited time, we are offering free property coaching to our listeners. We won't be able to do this forever, of course, so head to propertypals.au forward slash coaching. That's propertypals.au forward slash coaching to see how we can help you achieve your investment property goals. Link will be in the description too. Obviously, um, they're both pretty passionate about it, but there's, yeah, there's the opportunity cost. And I mean, there's definitely ways that I know, which I'm trying to teach people to simplify this process and it's a more enjoyable journey. Um, I think. I think about it. I think about it. Um, for me, my journey in property at the start was frustrating because I was trying to buy and flip and do it all myself, and that's the strategy I was going to do. I'm glad I pulled out of that. Since then, and this is as a personal story, I have really enjoyed it because I used a buyer's agent to buy my first property, and I spent probably I, I spent uh, probably an hour. Of maybe two hours of my time looking at the properties that they they put forwards compared to 247 i am so happy right yeah. and then the same on the second one working with you uh i did a little bit of research and sent you some crap ones and you're like no nah, they're shit and i'm like okay i'm just not going to look at all until you presented one and i'm like yeah, okay let's buy it you know like so i probably spent maybe five or six hours on that one but it was a great experience and i learned a lot and sure, you can learn a lot through your experience of like doing it yourself. But if you're doing it with a professional, you're going to learn, you know, a lot better and a lot more. So I think it's the difference of like saving money, but also sometimes we will spend our money. I know people will spend their money on a nicer resort or something, you know, a nicer car to enjoy their experience in life. And I think why not when we're investing do the same thing too. And I love, I'd, I'd love to like break down the numbers of 247 hours and nine months. You've got some numbers on like opportunity costs of like a certain acquisition size, what that opportunity cost would be being out of the, out of the market for nine months. What, what break yeah. down that for us? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so on average in Australia, seven to nine months is the, the buyer's time frame. Um, so if, if you're the unicorn buyer, in my mind, you're looking at probably one to two years um, in that you know, buy zone potentially. Mm. And uh, look, that's that's the reason why I'm sort of like hesitating and pausing is because that's if you find anything at all, right? And a lot of people get to that stage, and it's a, it's a real shame because. They've got. They've done all the hard work to get to that point where they actually can afford to buy an investment property or their next principal place of residence. But because they're going about it the hard way, they never actually take that next step and of that progression step into their life because they're looking for that unicorn and it all becomes too hard. They just can't be bothered with it. And then it's like, well, now you've built up this nice nest egg. Nest egg. You had this intention to do something with it. You know, it's. The, the investing principles, or sitting in cash, it's it's eroding over time through inflation. And also, if you've got a couple hundred grand sitting in cash, staring at you every single day, you're going to be more inclined to go and just spend it on something that doesn't give you true value back. Um, as an example, a jet ski. Yeah, good fun for a little while. <laughs> um, 
it kind of wears off then you've got to maintain it look after it and then uh you know yeah that's sort of uh, i see that i see it all the time basically put it that way um mm. so the third point i was hitting on is um yeah say you're in there for a year and this is just like you know, broad figures you've got a million dollar purchasing budget if you're looking into buying into a market a growth market well, on average, Australian property grows between 6 and 8% per annum each year. And obviously, there's markets that outperform that, some that underperform it. But on average, 6 8%. Based on that, if you've got a million-dollar purchase, you know, if you're out of that market for a year, that's sixty to $80,000 in um, cap- lost capital gains from you sitting on the sidelines for that whole entire time. Mm-hmm. And that's where you're starting to see these numbers cut to, to pile up. So if you've got that sixty to eighty thousand plus that twelve thousand dollars in your time looking for these properties that don't exist, and then the five thousand dollars in missed opportunities that you've gone through, you know, it, it just starts compounding quite um, significantly to get to that hundred k. And you know, it's it's a shame because I, I see it so often. Hence why I thought it'd be a, you know, <laughs> a bit of a helpful conversation to have. Yeah, it's really good. And I like how conservative you have been with those figures, right? Like 6 to 8%. For a growth area, let's be honest, we've seen more than 6 to 8%. Uh, and that could be timely because of like the, you know, the obviously let's not count the pandemic sort of era. But even after that, we've seen areas that have been more than 6 to 8% if they're growth areas. I would say 6 to 8% on average so being conservative with that and also you said it can take one to two years for a property you know a unicorn buyer um to and you did these numbers on one year so yep. at 60 to 80 if you did it on two years that's 120 to 160k plus your fees as you know of, of entry costs as well all your time cost and then your you know five properties or two properties even that you got some inspections and stuff done uh I like that you were conservative there. So, guys, being conservative, the numbers start to stack up. Like, wow! Like, when you when you look at those fees, it's pretty to 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 spend anywhere from ten to twenty grand on a buyer's agent. It's kind of like we're really advocating it here, but it, it it makes it like you'd be crazy not to use a buyer's agent that you find is going to be one that suits you and, and what you want and somebody that you resonate with. Yeah, yeah. But then there's like, I, I get it too. I don't want to, like, I'm not just pro buyers agent, I'm pro education as well. So if, you mm. have, if you've done enough education and you're keen to take on this path yourself, you know, more power to you, just don't be a unicorn buyer because these are the statistics that are weighed up against you. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the the overarching theme is that there's no perfect property you know, and um every single property is different right like aspects improvements land size location you know there's so many different elements to it that if you're looking for this perfect property at this perfect price i'm just telling you now straight up it doesn't exist um so there's always trade-offs but there's if those that are the best investors and the best purchasers they can see things that may be a perceived issue like oh the rent's not high enough um, for me to make this purchase okay cool well what can you do to increase that rent once it's your once it is yours is it a paint mm-hmm. job and then you can increase that rental that hits that target or you know it doesn't have a pool build one it doesn't have a fence put one in you know like there's yeah. different things about it like you want a four bedroom well you know you only need a three bedroom two bathroom at the moment uh, with your current family size so you know, there is that double lock-up garage and you can actually put a front, you know, uh, double lock-up carport at the front, do the fence in, you know, five years' time. Now you've got a four-bedroom, three-bathroom if you do that full conversion to the ensuite as well. And you're actually adding value to that asset too and it's it's income. There's always ways around it. It's yeah. just that I just see that people do have this constant, oh, that's that's not what I have in mind. And being in this industry, we, we see people, they come in with this intention of what they want to buy and what they end up transacting on often is completely different, being at either location, you know, improvement type or land size. What so, percentage What percentage of people would you say that you have found would come to you with their buying, buying criteria and then end up buying something completely different? Like what percentage? 
Well, this is this is the beauty <laughs> of, I guess, working with with me <laughs> is that I've I'm fine tuning this process to a point where we're having these hard conversations up front, and we're narrowing out what are your must haves and what are your nice to haves, mm. and then just being up front with them. So the the percentage is a lot low, but like you know, previously, you go on and say eighty percent of people are, are doing this, wow. where the what they end up buying is not what they went out intending to search for and that's also a big issue in um buyers that i'm finding and i've seen is just that you're going up against these um you know really like i guess the trust level on real estate agents is, is extremely low in in australia and i do understand that from the buyer's perspective but you got to understand that they're they're there to sell one property for their client who's a seller and they want you to, they want everyone to buy it those that are good train in all these scripts and dialogues to sell you on buying this asset type. So people that don't have those defined, I guess, um, barriers in place going into the purchasing environment, they're the ones that get sold on this this dream because you know, they get emotionally involved. They've spent that time. They've missed out on three of the properties. This one's not what we had in, in mind, but I'm sick of it. We wanted two bathrooms. This has only got one, but, you know, whatever let's just get it done we need a house to live in and we can do something with it it won't be our forever home even though we went in there thinking we'd find our forever home mm. and it could just be a conversation of well maybe you're not looking in the right suburb maybe you go to the next one but um having those hard conversations up front is really important yeah absolutely i feel that i i feel like a lot of people get conditioned from media to go for a property that is no longer negatively geared so they can build that property portfolio faster and that being a unicorn property and like an interest rate market like say we're in now um it's very hard to find those positively geared properties that yep. could be that that could be one massive buy mistake of like looking for that sort of unicorn in in the market now where like you have this location this asset type that you want but you also want it to be uh positively geared outside of like the amount of time those three points of like the time the time and costs you have it's of um you know spending years to find the right property and the cost involved with your own time and then the cost involved with like uh, the fees to look at other properties. Also, the time spent to look for that thing that doesn't exist where you could buy something that is a little bit le like negatively geared, right? Maybe it's like 100 bucks a week, which is five grand a year, but the property grows at a rate of, you know, say 8%, and it's a 500 grand property. And you might make forty grand in capital growth of the year, take off your five grand. There's an example that's thirty five grand, I guess, in the pocket, right? But people not understanding that can be the case, and there's a big opportunity cost of like trying to find that unicorn property that may not actually be, you know, positively hit. Yeah, yeah. In there's, there's no, there's no certainties, but I guess you look at it like if you had a vending machine and every dollar you put into it. It gave you two dollars back. Yeah, you know, would you not just keep putting the dollar in? <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's what property capital. is, right? Like, this is such a good vending machine that I have found. Like, it's one of the one yeah, of the better ones. It's, it's, instead of the dollar, you put you you have the physical dollar. <laughs> People apparently we're moving to a no currency, uh, no hard currency community. Australia, it's only a matter so of time. Yeah, we're all digital, so this is obviously yeah. Evergreen, <laughs> in the, <she> might <laughs> go, what's a coin? What are these guys talking about? What's a coin or a note? Yeah, anyway, um, yeah. It's just like you, you have the physical in your in your hand or like in your you know your current bank account. You put it in, and it's think of it as your property as your bank account. So you mm -hmm. put that dollar in, increases your value of two dollars. Fantastic, well done. Um, it's just the the psychological barrier of it all because once you put that dollar in, it's kind of like a it's like a short-term superannuation account you can't access it unless you, you know, sell mm. that asset which might take a few months to go down that path of getting it ready to sale but mm. you know, i can assure you that the money that you're spending on these properties especially in this market that we are in in australia is like i mean 
don't even take my word for it. Go back and look at the historical performance of the Australian property market. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, people were buying in 1999 houses in Bendigo for $44,000. Whoa. And now in Bendigo, they're worth $500,000 plus. So it's, you sit there and go, wow, that's more than a 10x return over that. Yep. What is it, 30-year period? It's um, pretty good. Pretty damn good. Absolutely. I think we I think we smashed it, Sam. Is there anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, I thought it would be good to give a few little helpful tips to, you know, just make sure that you're not falling into the trap of the unicorn property buyer. Um, mm. So I'll just rattle a few things off. And I mean, if we're right. going too fast, that's a beautiful thing about these podcasts is that you can rewind it, re-listen to it, take the notes. But um, yeah, the, the, the first thing you want to do is you know, get the laser focus into suburbs that you're wanting to buy in. So go on to you know, realestate.com or domain.com.au uh, or even you know, realcommercial, commercial.com.au for those commercial buyers out there and find those target suburbs that you're wanting to buy into. You know, from that, what you want to go through and outline is you want to have your must-haves and your nice-to-haves. So go into it thinking, well, this is exactly what I want. This is the preference. You're not going to budge on your must-haves. The key is not to have too many must-haves. So like around five is always a good number of um, you know, property you know, must-have criteria. And the rest of it's just a bit of a cream on top. So once you have all that, you're going into these search portals, you're putting in these key suburbs, you're filtering through, you know, in this case, say it's a you your must-have is a detached house with at least three bedrooms on at least 400 square meters of land in a, you know, established area so you put that in you put your filter search in and then go on to that portal look in the last three months this is key three months and see there's a little sort filter button that's there and sort from the you know the highest to lowest in that three month period and then you can scroll down and you can see the sold prices of these assets mm. and what you're going to want to be doing is just scrolling through going oh yep that fits my criteria i would have bought that and then trying to find those properties that you would have bought. If you get to that end of the three-month period and there's nothing in there that you would have bought, you're running the risk of being a unicorn buyer. So, ooh, good. Yeah, have, have a bit of think about that. And then, um, yeah, if that's the case, then let, have that hard conversation with yourself. What do you need to you know, reduce? Is it you need to move out of that high-expensive suburb because you, you can no longer afford it. And the reason why you're having these hard conversations now is because if you couldn't afford the less, like the neighbouring suburb that's not as expensive as the one that you want to be in, you're running the risk of in three months' time, you won't even be able to afford that other less expensive secondary suburb. And you're going into the, you know, even further out in that sense. Mm. So it's just keeping that in the back of your mind and running through that. That's a really key way to just you know, make sure what you actually want is still available. Yeah. So, yeah. Love it. Understanding the market. That's a really good process, guys. I wouldn't even say if you even just listen to it now and you got it, go back and listen to it again. Um, there may be like little hidden value gems in there of how to look at the current market conditions and see if your buying criteria matches that. It's yeah. Awesome, if, Sam. If, Love it. There's a three months, that's key. If you really want to be any like I mean Depends on the market you're in. If you're buying into a, a market that's growing in value, um, then stick to your three months. If you're in a, like a neutral market or a, a market that's reducing in value, and you look to data for these um, these metrics on whether it's neutral, positive, or or pulling back. Um, and if you're you know it's neutral or pulling back, then you can push it out to six months you know, by all means. Um, at least you're sort of making sure that it fits that criteria. Uh, but what I would say on that data front is just be sure that you know, we talked about this in a previous episode as well, but knowing what that data is doing and, and adding that to those sale prices I spoke about earlier. So if it was three months ago, that sale, and you would have bought it and your budget's a million bucks, if that area's grown you know, 3% in those three months, that's now a million and 30. It's no longer within your budget. So have those hard conversations, add that to your um, search criteria. Having these hard conversations up front uh, before you enter into uh, going and inspecting these properties and, you know, talking to agents or even engaging with a buyer's agent, you know, just 
you know, that's probably the, the key points I want people to take away from this um, because otherwise, yeah, you're, you're going to be that unicorn that's wasting your time and, you know, time is the most valuable resource to us all and we shouldn't be wasting it. That's my little motivational pitch at the end there, mate. Can't be that. All I can say is please share Sam some love uh, for that because this is a lot went into this and, uh, yeah, Hit the, hit the review button. We don't really ask you guys to review the pod. Uh, wherever you're listening, leave a comment, hit the review button, let us know what you like about it, um, and then also email us what you don't like about it so we can make it better. Email us your questions. Let us know. Uh, we're here to answer your questions and help you guys on your journey. So speak to you guys on the next one. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Bye for now.